You, you guys sound fired up in the Lord here tonight. A man named John C. Maxwell. Writer, the author of the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. Once wrote a little blurb on the world needing leadership. He says, the world needs leaders who lead themselves successfully before attempting to lead others. The world needs leaders who inspire and motivate rather than intimidate and manipulate. The world needs leaders who live with people to know their problems and live with God in order to solve them. The world needs leaders who encounter setbacks and turn them into comebacks. You see, his author had a deep conviction that the world needs leaders. But in my conviction is, we don't need more leaders for the world. We need some leaders for the Lord. The title lesson is simply that, the Lord needs leaders. If you're a man, any many men in the house here tonight? The Bible says the only real man, it's a man of God. And a man of God is a leader. So today or tonight, I thought we could study out the book of leaders. Let's go to the book of Judges. You didn't know the book of Judges, what it actually means is the book of leaders. As Judges means leaders. Now, we understand leading up to the book of Judges, let's just understand what we're, what's happening. In the Exodus movement, we understand Moses was called to go to the Promised Land. They crossed the Red Sea, and instead of what should have been a two-week journey, becomes 40 years wandering in the desert. And no one in that generation gets to the Promised Land, and Moses dies as he sees it from a mountain. But what Moses had a deep conviction on before his departure, that he had a conviction on a centralized leader with centralized leadership. He said he didn't want the people to be sheep without a shepherd. So he had a successor, and his name was Joshua. Joshua is an incredible general and was able to get the people to the promised land. Now, different from Moses, Joshua did not have the same conviction that Moses had. He did not choose a successor. When he went off to glory, he just said, I committed to the grace of God, and you guys just figure it on out. And that gave birth to the book of Judges. Now, let's see, what was the theme of the book of Judges? Let's go to Judges chapter 17. We're just, we're just setting the scene here so we understand what we're, what we're looking at. Judges 17, in verse 6, the Bible says, In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Let's go to chapter 18, verse 1. The Bible says again, In those days, Israel had no king. Let's drop down chapter 19, verse 1. Again, hope you're catching the theme here. In those days, Israel had no king. And let's look at the final chapter in chapter 21 in verse 25. The final verse in the final chapter of the book of Judges says, In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Most people understand that Samuel was the writer of the book of Judges. And he writes it during the time or the last moments of Saul's reign. And he writes the theme four times, repeats. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did what they saw fit. Now, I believe it's supposed to be a double meaning there. 
Samuel thought that maybe David could be the remedy. As Saul was going to now be no longer king, but David, because if we look at that in Samuel when they asked for a king, look at it as a sinful thing. In reality, it was actually prophesied in Deuteronomy 17 that they would have a king, and there are certain criteria the king had to have, but we understand Solomon destroys that criteria, and the rest of them destroyed as well. But they had no physical king, so everyone did what they wanted. But most importantly, God was not their king. Different in the kingdom of God, we have a king here. And our king is King Jesus. And because our king is King Jesus, we have laws, we have standards, and we have expectations for the people who will be in his kingdom. Very different from the book of Judges. Now we understand the theme. Let's go to the beginning. Let's go to Judges 1. I just want to share my quiet time with you. This is why I studied out this, this, this past month. And I would love to share it with you guys here. And I hope what I learned could help you guys out here tonight. In Deuteronomy 7, God commanded the people of Israel, when they go to the promised land, to completely destroy everything. And people could look at that and could struggle. Like, why would God say destroy all the people in the promised land? Well, Judges 1 and Judges 2 is an account of the Israelites failing to do that. Going into the promised land, and every single tribe, when they got their territory, did not completely obey the word of God. Let's see how bad was this. Let's go to Judges 1, and let's read verse 27. The Bible says in verse 27, but Manasseh did not drive out the people of Bethshan or Tanakh or Dor or Iblaim or Megiddo and their surrounding settlements for the Canaanites were determined to live in that land. When Israel became strong, they pressed the Canaanites into forced labor and never drove them out completely. So we understand Manasseh was a tribe, or the half-tribe of Manasseh, and the Canaanites were the enemies of God. God said, drive them out but they did not do it completely. So let's see what happens. We continue on in Judges chapter 2. Judges 2 and verse 1. The Bible says, The angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I brought you out of Egypt and led you into the land I swear to give your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down their altars. Yet you have disobeyed me. Why have you done this? And I've also said, I will not drive them out before you. They will become traps for you, and their gods will become snares to you. So the reason we understand why God commanded them to completely destroy the Canaanites, these people were in absolute apostasy towards God. Apostasy means they were totally There was no remedy for them. They were absolute pagans. They did things like children's sacrifice. Incest was a part of their culture. That's how they worshiped their gods. And God said, if you don't destroy them completely, they will become a snare or a thorn or a trap to you. That if you don't completely destroy them, you also will become them. My first point for you tonight, total destruction, the only solution. We have to understand how how we we read the Old Testament. The Old Testament is a physical foreshadowing of spiritual realities. Okay, so the Canaanites were the physical enemies of God. They were supposed to represent sin the Satan character, and demons. So the message for us, as Romans 15 verse 4 says, everything in the past is written so that we could learn from it. The message for us, we have to totally destroy all the Canaanites in us 
all the Canaanite in our fellowship all the sin. Because if we don't, it will become a snare to you. And just like the Israelites, how they failed to obey God, it went to complete apostasy. Let's see this, what the Bible says in Colossians 3. Let's go to Colossians 3. Total destruction, only solution. Colossians 3 and verse 1. The Bible says, So since then, you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is. See at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual morality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself, drive out all such things as these anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with this practice and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. What, a, what an amazing passage. It's quite hard life, just like what God says in Judges. It says first, it says, since then you've been raised with Christ. We understand what it means to be sound in doctrine. Someone must have faith in Jesus. They must make a decision to actually hold on to the teachings of Jesus Christ. In other words, become a disciple and then get baptized. And the Bible says in Romans 6, when we were baptized, we put to death our whole lives. We totally destroyed ourselves. We destroyed ourselves in Christ so that we could be a new creation. But it says that as you go on with this life, you have to continuously put to death. Because sometimes that Canaanite wants to take his head up a bit there. And you got to kill it. I don't know about you, but I never heard anything like that before growing up in church for 21 years of my life. Talking about being a disciple. Talking about holding on to the teachings of Jesus. Putting to death my sin. I never heard such things like that ever. Why is that? Because that's not a doctrine. That's not something that's popular for the masses. But God, the Bible says, never change. So he still wants us to totally destroy our sin. And finally, when someone came to me and showed me what this looks like, I made a decision to do it. Because God is serious about us living for him. It simply says, put to death, earthly nature, sexual morality, impurity, lust. I mean, this is men's midweek, right? I think sometimes we, we, we got to go to the nasty things of the scriptures. Where God's have to put to death these things. Not doing better in these things. Not, 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 not doing better. Just, just put to death. And he says that you could do that when you make a decision to clothe yourself with Christ. So the beautiful thing about this, everyone here is a baptized disciple. You have that power that you could totally change. That you could put to death your old life. Wasn't it amazing when you got baptized and you got the Holy Spirit? And God said, totally destroy yourself. the only solution. But you see, God wants to kill you, but he'll resurrect you. Satan wants to kill you, but there's no resurrection. And it's amazing that we can resurrect in God, that we can have a godly life, that we can be clothed with Christ if we put to death that Canaanite. I want to challenge us here tonight. Are there some Canaanites in your life right now that you're allowing to live? Here's one thing. Dead people are dead. Dead people don't complain. 
are some of us complaining about what God wants us to do? Or, or, or what about just living a life like a disciple? Doing the things that God wants us to do. We have to put to death total destruction, only solution. You know, we're family. And sometimes we need to have family talks. And we had a man amongst us who understood that prior to his conversion, he didn't really put to death these things. And we have deep convictions. Don't we not as, as a family? Yeah. That, that, that someone has to repent before they get baptized. Yeah. If they don't repent, then that wasn't really a baptism. Because we understand we put to death. And this, and this brother, he, he's, or this man, he, he came to us, and we've been getting with him on a weekly basis. And he finally realized, he's like, man, like, I, I need to get my life right with God. There was a lot of darkness in his life. The darkness of impurity, of immorality, and, and he kept it secret. He didn't drive out that Canaanite. But I'm proud of him because he is urgent now. He wants to get his life right with God. <laughs> you know, here's the thing. With a group just this big, I, I've been here for a little while. This is, a little bit of experience. I know there's probably some who have some hidden sin. And God's calling you tonight to get open about it. Put it to death. Because we understand that's the only solution. Let's go back to the book of Judges. So we saw in Judges 1 and 2, oh, thank you, bro. Judges 1 and 2 that the Israelites failed to drive out all of the Canaanites. Judges 3, 4, 5, and 6 takes account of different judges that raise up. You have Ehud. Yusuf had a very awesome short charge about Ehud at our preacher's academy. Go ask him about him in the fellowship. It's quite interesting. And then we have Deborah who raised up. Sadly, in this time, the men didn't want to raise up. And she kind of sticks it to them and sings a song when the princes of Israel lead. Basically saying, there ain't no princes right now. I'm the princess leading. But it shows us that the princes need to lead the way. And then you have one of my personal favorites, Gideon. Well, this guy, you know, he, he, like, he was uh, kind of down and out. He was discouraged. But God said, you're a mighty warrior. He had 32,000 people in his army. I know the ICCM students remember this on your test. I remember looking at it. Hopefully you got it right. 32,000 in his army. And God said, let's truncate it to 300. And they were able to defeat the Midianites. This guy was a bad dude. He had a great victory. But let's see, how did Gideon behave after this victory? Let's go to Judges chapter 8. In, in verse 22. So fresh off the victory. We see, in verse 22, there's a lie said to Gideon, rule over us, you, your son, and your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon told them, I shall now rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And he said, I do have one request, that to each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder. It was the custom of the Ishmaelites to wear gold earrings. They answered, we'll be glad to give them. So they spread out a garment, and each of them threw a ring from his plunder onto it. The way the gold rings, he asked, so he came to 1,700 shekels. Not counting the ornaments, the pendants, and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian or the chains that were on their camels' necks. He didn't make the gold into an ephod which he placed in Ophrah, not Oprah, his town, all Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there 
and he became a snare. Remember that word? To Gideon and his family. So what happens after a great victory, the people ask Gideon to be their leader. And what he does is he makes an ephod. Now, an ephod was a linen garment that the high priest wore to inquire of the Lord. The issue with this is, one, Gideon was not a high priest, so he's doing as he sees fit. One, and then they start to worship the ephod. And it said they prostituted themselves to this ephod. Our second point, total devotion or partial prostitution. So what happens is they find something that they love more than God. And we have to understand that Gideon learned this behavior from somebody. Judges 1 through 16 is actually not written in chronological order. The beginning of the book of Judges is actually Judges 17 to 21. So let's see, where did Gideon learn this behavior from? Let's go to Judges chapter 17. How do we know that Judges 17 21 is beginning? Well, in Judges 20, verse 26, it talks about Phineas, who's alive. And we know Phineas, the number is 25, that he was the man that destroyed and speared that guy who was with the Moabite while Moses was alive, showing that the events of Judges 17 and 21 were actually before Judges 1 to 16. So in Judges 17, I was studying, I was like trying to figure out why was this, why was this here? It seems a bit abrupt when you, when you read the book of Judges. You introduce this, this character named Micah. But in reality, Judges 17 verse, and chapter, chapter 17 and chapter 18, it lays down the foundation of what led to the partial prostitution of Israelites that eventually led to the total falling away of God. In Judges 17 verse 1, it says, now a man named Micah from the hill country of Ephraim said to his mother, the 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you and about which I heard you utter, utter curse, I had that silver with me, I took it. Then his mother said, the Lord bless you, my son. When he returned the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, she said, I saw me consecrate my silver to the Lord for my son to make an image overlaid with silver. I'll give it back to you. So after he returned the silver to his mother, she took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to a silversmith who used them to make the idol and was put in Micah's house. Now this man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod and some household gods and installed one of his sons as a high priest. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. The reason why this character Micah was introduced, because he was the one that laid the foundation of prostituting themselves to idols. And Gideon imitated that behavior as opposed to being totally devoted to God. And you know what can happen even in our lives? We can start to build some idols in our lives as well. We can start to look at things that are shining, things are, that, that look nice, and we put them above God. Instead of being totally devoted, we go to these other things as idols. Something that can be terrible things like sin, but something that can even be good things like school, like work, or even, I don't have any kids, but maybe even kids or, or our spouses or your girlfriend or things of this nature. And we can look at these things and not be devoted to God and start to prostitute ourselves and not have a total devotion. And that's what was happening in the book of Judges. We understand in Deuteronomy 6, the greatest command is given. To love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that's what Jesus says in Matthew 22. What's the greatest commandment? It's to love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. I, I think as men, we have to just go back to our first love. Go back to being totally devoted, totally reliant on God. Because my Bible says that when you love God, Obeying his commands are not a burdensome. It becomes a burden when there's no true love. Contribution becomes a burden. Missions becomes a burden. Sharing your faith becomes a burden. But you love God, you can't help but share your faith. And I'm excited. I'm about to celebrate my one-year anniversary in the Lord with my wife. 
And honestly, like, when you're in love, you do some crazy things. I, I didn't know I was a poet. I, 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 I didn't know I could write poetry. I don't know. Something came over me when, when, I, mean, when I started Danny Regine. I remember for, our, for our one year, I, I made a poem. I had to send it to my, my, my mentor uh, at that time, Kwaku, to make sure that it was sound, sound of the doctrine there, because I, I didn't want to go over a boy event. Kwaku's like, bro, you can't say this like that. Because I was so in love. I couldn't help but express how I felt. I was like, man, I'm, I'm fired up on my girlfriend. I, I, I'm fired to say, I love you. That was, like, that was like a big deal to say first year. But I couldn't help but express my love. When you're totally devoted, you can't help but express your love. You can't help but share your faith. You can't help but to show up to Bible talk. You can't help but to, to be committed to God. When you totally are devoted, you say, man, God, the best thing a part of my life. We just got to go back to loving God. The men lead the way in this area. I, I, I think just, just to speak on this, uh, I, I think right now we're in operation solidification. And I, I do believe that for the brothers, for the most part, there is a great commitment there. I know we have some situations there. I'm speaking as a family. This is some family time here for, for men's business. But the, the thing about what we need to solidify is we need the brothers to step up and lead. Because then the sisters will follow. And, there needs to, and where does that come from? It comes from not just listening to If you feel the pressure from your leader more than the inward pressure, there's an issue with the love of God in your heart. There's an issue there. There should be a great catharsis, a great emotional feeling with God that leads to conviction. And when you're totally devoted, all of this becomes such an opportunity and a pleasure and a privilege. Let's make a decision tonight to go back. I don't know what you got to do. I don't know if you got to go to a prayer spot or, or, or go and get open by all your sin. I don't know what you got to do, but we got to get back just being totally devoted to God. And love God all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I believe that's going to change the whole Metro Coast, change the whole city of Angels Church, change the whole United States of America, change the whole world. <laughs> Last point. Desperation. The greatest motivation. So we see... Again, remember, Judges 17 and Judges 21 is the beginning of Judges. So we're seeing how bad it's going to get. What happens, we read in Judges 19 about a man, about a Levite, who we later on learn is actually Moses' grandson. And it's amazing to see how far the people have gone. And you read something like, just makes your bone shudder. And it's so disturbing as you read it. Judges 19 and verse 22. Bible says in verse 22, while they're enjoying themselves, some of the wicked men in the city have surrounded the, the house. Pounding on the door, they shout to the old man who owned the house, Bring out the man who came to your house so we can have sex with him. The owner of the house went outside and said to them, No, my friends, don't be so vile. Since this man is my guest, don't do this outrageous thing. Look, here is my virgin daughter and his concubine. I'll bring them out to you now, and you can use them and do to them whatever you wish. But as for this man, don't do such an outrageous thing. But the men would not listen to him. So the man took his concubine, sent her outside to them, and they raped her and abused her throughout the night. And at dawn, they let her go. At daybreak, the woman went back to the house where her master was staying, fell down at the door, and lay there until daylight. When her master got up in the morning and opened the door of the house and stepped out to continue on his way, there lay his concubine falling in the doorway of the house with their hands on the threshold. He said to her, get up, let's go. But there is no answer. 
Then the man put her on his donkey and set out for home. When he reached home, he took a knife and cut up his concubine, limb by limb into 12 parts, and sent them to all the heirs of Israel. Everyone who saw it was saying to one another, such a thing has never been seen or done. But since the day the Israelites came out of Egypt, just imagine, we must do something. So speak up. Desperation, the greatest motivation. You, you, you read this passage, it is so disturbing. I remember the first time reading this. I remember actually I was a non-Christian and I came to a Bible talk. And the Bible talk leader, his name is Dustin Miller, chose to, 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 to do this Bible talk. And I was so taken aback. I was like, holy smokes, this is in the Bible. And you read it, it's just so dark. Remember, this actually is falling right after the events of Joshua's death. So the people see this, and they're so bothered. They say, we've never seen anything like this before. Who's going to stand up? Who's going to be desperate? Who's going to do something about it and speak up and raise up and be a leader? I remember two days before I got baptized, I met a guy, and he told me his life story. And I've never heard anything like it before. Using a gang, and verbatim the exact same thing that happened to this woman, he did to somebody with his gang. She was abused, killed, cut limb by limb. Never heard anything like that before. The night before I got baptized, I couldn't sleep. I was so excited. But also so nervous. I remember I was with Christian Enos down at the lobby at the Anaheim Hilton. There's a guy just pacing back and forth while I was there sitting down with Christian. And he comes to us and says, like, man, there's still something about you guys. I, I just got to tell you something on my heart. And the guy told us, there I met in my life, that he was about to go kill his wife. And we were like, holy. I was like, bro, we talked to him all night and tried to talk him out of it. Uh, he didn't go and do it. But he came to church that Sunday. But left and said it was too much, he was too holy, and he just leaves. We try to call him, try to get in contact with him. Never, never saw him again. And I believe that God allowed these things to happen two days before I got baptized. To show me how dark the world is. To show me that the world is harassed and helpless. And there needs to be a desperation. And you're seeing on the news all these mass shootings, little kids getting shot. Innocent people. I believe God's looking down right now and saying, who's going to speak up? Who's going to do something about it? Who's going to raise up? Who's going to be a modern-day judge? And I believe right now, I'm looking at a group of men. A group of men in the West. A group of men in the Southland. A group of men in the Metro Coast. We're going to say enough is enough. We're desperate and we're going to speak up. We're going to raise up and we're going to do something about it. What, what, what does that look like? It's time to raise up and be a leader. Find a way to lead in God's kingdom. The, the Lord needs some leaders to raise up. We need some new Bible talk leaders. We need, we need some new shepherds in training. We need some new disciplers. We need people just to get a vision to be fruitful. When's the last time you got your sleeves wet and helped someone get into the waters of baptism? If it's been months, it's time to get in the waters of baptism and help someone get their life out with God. That's what the world really needs. 
in these men, we, we don't need what the, 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 what the religious society shows us. A soft-spoken men, men who don't want to lead, men who let their, let their wives lead or their girlfriend lead. We don't need that. We need men to be men of God and rise up and say, we are going to be God's modern day instruments. And then when this happens, that's when the whole series of all those judges raise up. But what's so sad is that the people still did not totally obey. It's a lesson to be learned for us that God does limit himself to leaders, but we got to get the job done. That's what this whole operation is about. Operation Jerusalem is not just those who came from San Francisco. Operation Jerusalem is everyone who's in the City of Angels Church. And we're here not just to play part for a couple months. We're not here just to play part for a year. We're here to finish the task. We cannot, we can't build a judge's ministry. We need a Jesus ministry. Where there's enough leaders that we could go out and win the world for God. And God's people could be safe. Because God limits himself to us. Let's go to Philippians 2 and close out. Philippians 2, in verse 12. The Bible simply says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my absence, but now much more, my presence, but not much more in my absence. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. It's quite simple. God limits himself to us. This scripture says, in order to fill God's good purpose, he's going to do it through you. He's going to do it through Aline. He's going to do it through Jacob. He's going to do it through Caleb. He's going to do it through Federico. Only if you raise up to do it. It's simple. The Lord, our Father in heaven, he needs some leaders. Let's be the men that raise up for the Lord. To God be the glory.